Today I'm checking out three of the systems over at the deck here where I do a lot of work. Uh, the first one's going to be an America Standard. I think it's 11 Sear. Oh, 12, sorry. 12, manufactured in August of 1999. And it's the one with the filthy coil. We just redid the return duct on. So I've already shut off the power. I'm going to take a look at the capacitor and make sure that's all squared away along with the contactor. I forgot how many screws are on here. I should have brought my drill. Luckily some of them missing. We have three systems total to take care of. The one American Standard. Oops. The one American Standard. Well, that's how it happens. That's how the screws disappear right there, gentlemen. But that's okay. So I'm going to break out my big cup of backup screws and replace those. take off the first panel we have our reversing valve our manifold for the outdoor unit our outdoor TXV it's uh, our low voltage connections and of course our outdoor coil it's a little dirty needs a little cleaning needs a little love or just a people to love it Inside we have our run capacitor, start capacitor, start relay, contactor, and defrost controller. I switched from my uh, dry erase form to my write-on form because I have three systems to do, so I had to fill out three different forms anyway. So the first thing I'll do, I'll fill out the this information, the temperature information, whenever I get to the charging part. Right now I'm going to be doing the contactor, which looks kind of rough anyway. Might end up getting a new contactor. All the pitting inside. This looks pretty bad. Okay, but first we'll be doing the run capacitor. And like I said, the power is off. Our one brown wire there coming from the fan. We have both of our oranges, which are to the hermetic terminal. And we have purple and red to the common terminals. All right. All right, first of all, we're going to check our hermetic side. See, it's a 40 slash 5. So we're looking for 40 microfarads on the hermetic side to common and 5 on the fan side to common. Go to microfarads. Find our common. Find our hermetic. We are at 38.9, which is fine. Now we're going to go to fan. We are 5.1, which is fine. Try to put these back to our orange wires. We're on Herm. They slide on and off real easy. Go ahead and snug them back up a little bit so they'll fit. Because you don't want to come check them out and loosen them up and be the cause of the problem. That one, nope. A little bit too much. Nice and tight.
Hey guys, I've been wondering something. Maybe you guys can tell me. I've been looking for a good battery vacuum to take on these things. Uh, give me some suggestions if you have any. All right, we're all back there. What I'll do now is I'll take the one wire off the contactor. We're not calling for cooling or anything like that. Obviously, because it's not drawn in. Set it to ohms. Take our wire off the contactor. Put it in a safe spot. So the power is still on in the low voltage system as a precaution. We have 16.8 ohms. So it's good, although it is looking a little rough in the contacts area. Okay, so that's good. We'll do a defrost here when we start it up in heat. But uh, I'm gonna tidy things up in here. I really need to spray down this coil, but the water pressure here is just horrible. So. Uh, Let's see, I might spray it down when we're done, I guess. Alright, on to the next one. So we have our gauges set up, and I use the S Man gauges for R22 applications. I use my uh, uh, Testo 550s for all the R410A stuff. Um, just so I can leave the hose on all the time and I have a good set of gauges for either refrigerant. So we're talking about subcooling and superheat. So we're going to get our superheat measurement for both heating and cooling cycle right here. This is our returning line to the compressor. We have a temperature uh, K-fitting pipe clamp on that. We're taking suction pressure from this line because in heating mode this is the only place you're going to get a suction pressure that's correct. And uh, subcooling, we're out here on the liquid line. The liquid exiting in cooling mode after being condensed in the condenser coil is also the liquid re entering from the indoor evaporator, which in the heating mode becomes a condenser coil. So, in either mode, we're getting our correct pressure and temperature for subcooling because you have a TXV on the outer part of the units that requires some degree of subcooling and produces some degree of superheat. So we're going to see what each one of them produce. Cooling, heating, as uh, we move on through the test. I'm not going to wash everything till afterwards because it creates a mess and I have to work over here in a small area and it's going to be a big puddle of water and I'm not having that. There's not enough dirt on this coil to uh, <coughs> change the measurements very much at all. So I'm not really concerned about that. I'm more concerned about sitting in a puddle of water. So uh, we're going to get onto it and see how it works. We're going to first put it in uh, put it into uh, Wait a little while in heating mode, especially when you're checking the uh, amperages on the compressor because it will build over a period of time. So, you know, give it 10 minutes or so and see what it builds up to because, as you see, it will continue to go up as the pressure is raised up. As you see, we have 9 degrees of subcooling on this TXV right here. and 27 degrees of superheat being produced. So we're gonna let it build up and see where it gets to while I charge okay, this. There's camera. our heating pressures. You see the high side is a very high 340 almost. Low side's 86.7. Our TXV on the outdoor unit looks like it's doing a very good job giving us 15 degrees of superheat to ensure there's no liquid getting back to the compressor because there's no accumulator on the system. So if liquid got back to the compressor there's no accumulator to stop it and boil it off. So you basically got TXV out here has to be doing its job or else it's got to really muck up the compressor. We have an extremely high pressure on the high side and the reason that is is if you guys recall if you watched some of the prior videos you saw me uh, pull out an evaporator and clean it and the fins were falling apart and that's the evaporator. It's now the condenser in the heating cycle and you see it's not it doesn't have good heat transfer the pressures are high it's it's, it's warmer than it would be normally running in heat so it, it would be an elevated pressure anyway, but it's extra high because that uh, condenser inside 
is really not doing its job because it's not letting enough air through it. It's not letting the heat transfer process happen like it's supposed to, so you get a little bit higher pressure. Uh, the saving grace for these guys is that they don't run heat very often. Um, otherwise, they'd have a real problem because if this builds up long enough, you're going to have an issue with the compressor or maybe even a bleed off scaring the crap out of everybody. So uh, that's where we're at in the heating cycle. Uh, we've checked cooling too and uh, see how it looks. It's going to look a whole lot better than this is, I guarantee that. Here's our force defrost. Make sure it's happening. Unit switches into cooling. Pressure's come down because we're in cooling now. Melts off the ice on the outdoor coil. You see here. And then in a few seconds it'll go through the cycle. The fan will come back on. We'll go back into heating and start building up our pressure again. I think it lasts oh, up to a minute or so. It might be. I can't quite recall. But right now we're running through the defrost cycle. There we go. Is our fan. Our reversing valve should be coming shortly. There it goes. And we're back in the heating. Pressures are starting again. They're going to start building back up again to where we were before. And uh, that's how you test defrost there. You're basically putting a short in between the forced defrost and test fans on this board.